Hi, I'm uh, Dan Cornell, I'm the CTO at Denim Group, and uh, I want to talk about a, a challenge that we've seen with a lot of organizations, that we, uh, and, and really what that challenge boils down to is we see a whole lot of people that buy scanners. We see a lot fewer people that make very effective use of those scanners. So we see a lot of people that are buying a lot of technology, whether it's a, a code scanner or an app scanner, um, <clears throat> but then they don't get the, uh, you know, on, you know, after making that technology investment, uh, they don't really get much out of it. So uh, I wanted to talk about some things that we've seen, um, you know, metrics you can use to look at your application portfolio and the assurance activities that you're undertaking uh, to hopefully get the most out of the technology that you're investing in, uh, in, in getting that kind of uh, coverage. Um, for some reason, there's a picture of me on the slide, but with much less hair, I suppose. Um, I guess it's almost time to go and get my semi-annual haircut. Um, but again, uh, I'm the founder and CTO at Denim Group. And I'm a software developer by background. Um, you know, started out in the mid to late 90s doing a lot of server-side Java stuff, uh, e-commerce and, and Java servlets and whatnot. Um, then in the early 2000s, did a bunch of work with the early .NET framework uh, on the Microsoft side of the house. But really for the last eight or nine years, what I've spent my, uh, the majority of my time in my career doing is looking at how software developers impact the security of the organizations that are actually using and deploying their software. And so, uh, you know, I come as a software developer who's you know, now focused on the world of security as opposed to somebody with a more traditional penetration testing, back, uh, you know, penetration testing or IT audit background who's now looking at web and mobile applications. And that, I, I think, colors a lot of what, uh, a lot of what I say. Uh, I also help, the, I run the OWASP San Antonio chapter. And uh, so if anybody up here from San Antonio? Very good, look at this, there we go. Welcome, welcome everyone. Anybody come up on the free? Uh, we for San Antonio uh, OWASP members, we uh, had uh, had a bunch of people come up here or offered to come up here for free. Anybody? Okay. Well, there we go. All right. The system works. <laughs> now, so here, who here has purchased some sort of an automated scanner, either a code scanner or an application scanner? All right. Okay. Good. Almost almost everybody. Excellent. <laughs> um, you know, static. Dynamic. Both. Okay, good, excellent. Um, you know, desktop based. All right. Now, one of the like enterprise or server based. The cloud. Yeah, excellent. Uh, who here is uh, happy with their scanner? Uh, one. Nobody else. K kind of. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yes, one person, one and a half people for having their scanner. <laughs> um, I'm curious, why or why not? Why are you halfway happy with your scanner? Uh -huh. A lot of noise comes back from scanners. Anybody else? Why do you not love your scanner as much as you could? Anyone? Nobody? Nobody else to talk? I don't, I don't, I mean, like the IBM and HP guys, they can't hurt you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe, I don't even know if they have any representatives in the audience. Uh, you know, Josh, I think you said you liked your scanner. Why, why do you like it? Uh, it just works. I, I have it run in the background. It scans every single time. It does its thing. It finds the bones. Yeah. I seldom have to get involved with scanning anything. Well, there you go. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> Anybody else? Thoughts on why they do or do not like their scanner? Yeah, no? All right. This is a, the Friday afternoon crowd. <laughs> um, and so the, the challenge that, that I see with a lot of organizations, and I think what Josh said speaks to this, um, and uh, you know, speaks to this on the one side, uh, also you know, we hear on, on, the, on the other side, um, a real challenge that we see in a lot of organizations is they, they have a scanner, but they don't have a system in place to make sure that they're actually using that scanner that's being used on a regular basis, the, that the results are appropriately tuned, and that uh, when you find things with the scanner, they actually get driven through to completion. Um, and there's, uh, you know, again, those are kind of a lot of steps, but in organizations we've seen that have been successful rolling out scanning technologies, um, we found that it's important to look at the rollout not as, you know, not from the standpoint of, okay, well, you know, we, we did our bake off, you know, we argued with the vendor on pricing, uh, you know, the purchase order finally went through, they cut me a key, sent it to me, I downloaded the scanner, loaded up the key, you know, scanned the heck out of everything I could find, you know, in, <laughs> that was nearby on my network, 
you know, emailed a couple of 300 page PDF reports with color graphs out to the development teams responsible for the apps. You know, and then like a squirrel runs by the window or there's a, you know, an incident you've got to deal with or it's time to update the, you know, the antivirus or something and the scanner gets like put off in the, in the, in the corner. And we see a lot of, uh, a lot of situations where uh, the, you know, the scanners just don't get used, which is really unfortunate, you know, especially after you spend a lot of money on acquiring this technology and a year goes past and your boss walks by and says, you know, hey, how's that? Yeah. Should, should I feel a whole lot more secure because we bought $100,000 worth of XYZ scanner? And the answer is, uh, well, you should in a week after I spend, you know, after I go and like rescan everything. And so, you know, the successful organizations tend to look at this more from a programmatic standpoint. <coughs> and, uh, you know, again, the, the typical goal is you want to reduce your risk by reli reliably creating acceptably secure software. Um, and this is something, you know, again, as a, in a security talk, you've got to have the obligatory uh, people, process, and technology reference. Uh, the scanner, in this case, is the technology, but you've also got to have people that know how to use it. You've got to have the process in place that tells you when to use it and what to do with that. Um, in the spirit of uh, security talks, does anybody have a good Sun Tzu quote? Anyone? I've actually, uh, you know, and I've talked to Jim Manico about this. Uh, I, like, I want to start replacing, I, I think that security people might get a lot more done. They might be a lot more effective in their organizations if their talks were all based off of Dalai Lama quotes instead of Sun Tzu quotes. Uh, maybe maybe get a little bit of friendlier image. I don't know. It's a, it's a you know, whatever topic for a different uh, for a different day. <clears throat> but what uh, what you see across security programs is there there's common activities, and one enumeration of these activities is the uh, Open Software Assurance Maturity Model, and uh, this is an open framework that is intended to help organizations formulate and implement a strategy uh, for rolling out their software assurance or their software security program. And uh, we've had a lot of success using OpenSAM in, uh, in, in a couple different ways. It's great to go in and look at an organization to see what is the current state of processes uh, and, and practices that you have in a given development team. All right, so let's use it as a yardstick to measure how well a specific team is doing. Um, you know, it's very, very useful for that, and it gives you an idea of I mean, here's where we're at. Uh, it can also be really helpful to set a roadmap out so that you know, okay, well, if I know where I'm at, given using this as a yardstick, what changes do I want to make to my program? And uh, you know, you know, a challenge is that you're not going to be able to fix everything overnight. I mean, that's just the, the way that the world works. I mean, overall, that's the way that the world works. That's certainly the case uh, when you're looking at software assurance or software security programs where you have to get folks both from the you know, coding world and the security world, sometimes the IT audit world, you've got to get them to, you know, uh, to work together. And so uh, we've also had a lot of success uh, laying out a roadmap saying, well, this is where we're at right now. You know, in this next, uh, you know, uh, over, over the next quarter, what we want to focus on is getting our static analysis program where we feel like it needs to be. Or uh, you know, over this next quarter, we really feel like we need to get um, blanket training uh, underway for everyone, and we need to start thinking about targeted training for certain classes of, of, of developers. Um, and the main website, this is an OWASP project, the main website is uh, www.opensam.org. And it's currently undergoing uh, some, some revisions right now, which is, uh, which is good. Um, you know, Sam starts out with four different business functions. These are the core activities that any organization that's performing software security um, is going to, you know, are going to be undertaking. And so that's looking at governance. How are you structuring your program? Uh, you know, what, what are the metrics around it? Construction. Let's look at the steps we're taking when we're building software. Um, and how are we, you know, why after we're done building software should we expect uh, that that software has been built with appropriate security? Uh, looking at the verification, you know, after we've built software, what activities do we have in place to go and test that software to make sure that we've been successful uh, rolling out uh, or, or building software with the level of security that we expected? And finally, deployment, right? Software, uh, you know, once you build it, you've got to deploy it, and then you've got to pay attention to it when it's out in production, you know, deal with uh, you know, potential incidents and vulnerabilities that are identified along the way. Um, each of these business functions uh, get broken down into specific security practices. Um, and so for governance, you see we've got strategy and metrics. You know, what, are the, what are the goals of the program and how do we measure um, what, we're, uh, you know, what we're doing in the program so that we can make a determination if we feel like we're successful or not? Policy and compliance. Um, you know, for, for better or for worse, I think in a lot of cases worse, you know, compliance is the driver for a lot of software security activities. Uh, how many folks here are you know, subject to PCI? Sarbanes-Oxley? HIPAA? All kinds of fun stuff. Uh, and would you say overall, uh, well, I, I guess and I've, I've seen two 
you know, common cases. You know, we've, I've seen certain cases where organizations wouldn't be doing anything about software security, but because PCI mandates that you train your developers and, and do uh, you know, penetration testing, they train their developers and do penetration testing. Uh, how many folks have been spurred to action uh, by PCI? No. The other challenge that we see in a lot of cases is that PCI comes in and sucks up all the oxygen out of the room, right? It, your PCI says you've got to do all these different things. Once you go through and do all those different things, what you find out is that like 107% of your budget is gone, and, uh, you know, and, and, and you can't do the things that you actually wanted to do to go and manage risk. Has anybody ever run into that problem? <laughs> so policy and compliance is understanding you know, what compliance requirements do you have and what are the policies that your organization has in place uh, you know, to, to, to drive you toward obeying the things you need to do for compliance. Uh, finally, under governance, we have education and guidance. I've always, uh, you know, I've got a, a, you know, I'm a computer science degree and I've, uh, I'm a programmer by background, and it's amazing to me that in all the time I spent in undergrad uh, taking computer science classes, which I took a lot of, because I was super cool when I was in college, and the only two times we talked about security were in, a, in, the, in our graphics class when the question was who could show the funniest X window on the professor's uh, you know, Unix workstation. Uh, and in a systems administration class where we learned that we could tell them to port 25 and fake emails um, as if we were professors. Right? Those are the only two times we talked about security in, a, uh, you know, in what I consider to be a pretty good uh, education, uh, you know, to, you know, vocational education to come out and be a developer. And uh, you know, again, it's, security just wasn't something that was discussed. And so what we're finding is aftermarket you have to uh, train developers about security because they don't you know, they don't typically learn it um, you know, during the, you know, their ed the typical education most developers go through. Under construction, so when we're building software, there's a couple of areas where we need to uh, pay attention. Threat analysis, you know, what sort of an environment is this software going to be deployed out into? And what sort of folks, uh, you know, typically malicious, uh, are, are we going to expect might take an interest in this software? And so how mature are you as an organization of looking at and understanding threats? Uh, security requirements. You know, again, if you don't train developers how to build secure code, you probably shouldn't expect them to build secure code. And similarly, if you don't lay out requirements for the security of your software, it's not really fair to expect, after everything's said and done, that the software actually has the security properties that you expect. And so how mature is your organization laying out uh, good security requirements? <coughs> Finally, secure architecture. You know, when you structure your systems, uh, are you building them in such a way that you help to minimize your attack surface and to minimize the opportunity for introducing different types of weaknesses and vulnerabilities? On the verification side, design review. What steps do you have in place in your organization to review a design before it's approved? Uh, again, to make sure that it's got appropriate security controls. Then we look at code review, and this is when we see code scanners start to get integrated as well as manual code review. Now, how much of your code base or code bases are you scanning? You know, how thoroughly are you scanning them, and are you, uh, you, know, and, and are you under, undertaking you know, manual assessment activities as well? And then looking at security testing. This is where we see a lot of dynamic scanning activities incorporated. Um, you know, once the software is up and running, what sort of testing are you doing to see, um, you know, against the live software, are you doing to see if you were successful building the software you wanted to? Uh, and under, de under deployment, Sam looks at vulnerability management. You know, when vulnerabilities are identified, and they will be, how mature are your processes for running those vulnerabilities through, uh, you know, through a, a process to say, okay, this is a problem. Are we going to fix it? What sort of countermeasures? Let's make the fix and get this thing pushed out into production. Uh, environment hardening. How good is your organization at taking the code you're developing and putting it onto an infrastructure that's going to support your security goals? And finally, operational enablement. Right? You know, once you deploy software, how, you know, how good of a position have you put your application operation folks into um, you know, in order to be able to actually manage and track the security of the you know, security state of the system over time. Um, each of those 12 practices gets broken out into three, or actually four different levels, zero being we're not doing anything in this area. Um, and then you can look through OpenSAM, but you know, they do a good job of, or a reasonably good job of talking about, you know, if your security program has these characteristics, you will you know, fit into a level one, a level two, or a level three, you know, with three being the most for sure. Um, and so I've found, uh, I've found OpenSAM to be a pretty good tool. It, it's at a good level of granularity. Um, 
for analyzing a team. It's not, has anybody here had experience with capability maturity model, CMM, CMMI, stuff like that? Did you feel like you got a whole lot of value out of your, <laughs> out of the work you did with CMMI? Uh, unless you're a consultant uh, you know, doing CMMI evaluations, you might not. <laughs> I, I haven't seen a lot of organizations that have willingly embraced uh, CMMI. Um, just because it's so ornate, it's so elaborate. <laughs> Um, and so OpenSAM, again, 12 different areas to measure, uh, three different levels for each of them. That's a fairly, uh, it's, it's a tr an attractable level of detail um, you know, in, in practice. And so what part does scanning play looking at this overall security program? And so you know, automated scanning, as, as I mentioned, is both part of the security testing and the code review security practices within the verification business function. And this is a really common starting point for a lot of organizations that are embarking on some sort of a software security program. Um, you know, it's a very natural thing. You know, again, hey, I've got an application. You know, scan my application and tell me if uh, you know, if, if if we've uh, got anything that uh, you know, that's wrong. Um, one huge red flag that we've found in going around and talking to organizations, we say, what are you doing to ensure the security of your applications? All right, if they say we bought AppScan. Right? Or we bought Web Inspector, we bought Fortify, or we bought XYZ. Right? If, you know, if, we bought, if the answer is what are you doing for security is we bought a scanner, there's a, a high correlation, uh, in, in, in my experience, there's a high correlation between having that conversation and finding out that the scanner may have been purchased, but the scanner is probably not in regular and active use. Um, and again, it goes back to the, the challenge that uh, is kind of the premise of this, or as we talked about at the beginning, which is um, we see a lot of scanners being purchased, um, but less scanner usage. Um, here's a couple anti-patterns we've seen for scanning, uh, scanning programs. There's the dude with the scanner approach. Uh, as we're all aware of women in information security, you will all be thrilled to know that this can be uh, implemented as the lady with the scanner approach. Uh, it works. It's, it's equally ineffective with both genders. Um, you know, but that's where, again, you, know, you go out and uh, you know, purchase a scanner. The week that you get the scanner, somebody runs around, makes a bunch of noise, maybe knocks an app or two over doing some scanning, um, aggravates a couple development teams with some uh, nasty emails and giant PDF documents, um, and then you know, nothing happens after that. Um, and you know, again, the challenge there is that you've you know, purchased a scanner, uh, you know, somebody ran around and used it, but they used it in a very tactical way. Um, without thought to the follow-up of, okay, well, how are we going to manage these vulnerabilities through resolution? Um, and applications change over time. You know, just because you scan something once doesn't mean that the next time it's, uh, you know, that, that, that after new features get added, after you know, changes get made, um, you know, fixes and things get applied, um, you know, this, you know, scanning is not something you can do once and forget. Um, you know, similarly, we see or some organizations say, okay, well, you know, we just you know, turn this over to the cloud. We bought a whole bunch of cloud-based scanning. Um, with the challenge being they're not actually going to see, you know, are the apps that we have signed up for cloud scanning, number one, you know, have we got the scanning you know, turned on? You know, have we provisioned this? Uh, you know, we might have bought 100 units. Have we actually got 100 different scans being run? Um, you know, and uh, you know, is the technology working appropriately? Right? You know, you know, have I looked to see, you know, am I getting good coverage from the scans or do we need to tweak something? You know, when we look at scanners, you know, a lot of times with scanners, you run into challenges where you have um, you know, misses either in breadth or in depth. And so looking at your program, you know, breadth misses occur when you don't understand the entire uh, attack surface of your organization. You don't know the entire portfolio of applications that you have. And as a result, you might be scanning some things, but you're not scanning others because you don't know that they're there. Uh, you know, we also see problems where applications don't get scanned frequently enough. Again, these uh, applications change over time, software changes over time. And, uh, you know, and, if, and if you're not following up scanning activities with, with future scanning, you run into problems. We also see a lot of challenges um, with uh, you know, depth misses, where, you're, uh, you know, where the scanner's not getting good at crawling of the application's attack surface, um, where, you're not getting, uh, you know, where you're not seeing a lot of benefit you know, because you're missing parts of the application. Again, if there's parts of the application that exist that you're not, that you're not testing, you, you don't know, um, and so that you know, sets you up to potentially have false negatives, right? So you know, you've, got, uh, you know, you've run a scan, but you missed half the application attack surface. You, know, you don't know if there are vulnerabilities there. If, those are, if there are li live vulnerabilities there, you have false negatives. You, know, you also run into problems with certain scanning technologies where they have excessive false positives. 
And that's essentially a denial of service against the security analyst where if the scanner comes back and says, I've got a million billion uh, you know, vulnerabilities, you know, if you have to wade through all that data, you know, test through each of them, figure out like, oh, actually this is a, you know, five examples of the same vulnerability, or this is an example of a vulnerability, but this, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a false positive from the scanner, you know, that makes your use of the scanner, uh, or th that makes the value that you get out of the scanner a lot less effective. Um, <clears throat> We see also some organizations that have uh, you know, some, some better patterns. You know, in some organizations, it makes sense to do breadth first scanning. Right? And again, you want a scanning program here, not a scanner. But if you have an organization that has a whole lot of applications right, that you've never looked at before, you, know, you may want to find out really quickly, you know, for all the applications that we have publicly exposed, do we have any really disgusting you know, SQL injection or cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, the stuff that are easy to find, easy to exploit? You know, <clears throat> we want to look across the entire portfolio to see if we have any stuff hanging out there um, you know, that we need to address. Another approach is to do deeper assessments of critical applications, <clears throat> you know, which is typically a combination of automated scanning, manual scan, uh, review, and assessment. Uh, you know, and, and again, depending on the organization, uh, you, your, your priorities may be different. You may have a couple critical systems where you have service level agreements with important customers and you need to ensure, hey, we need to have uh, a high degree of confidence in the security of these applications. Again, or your concern may be, you know, we haven't done anything for software security and we're concerned, you know, because our attack surface is so broad, um, you know, we're concerned that, uh, you know, you know we, need to, we need to take a look at our public attack surface first. Um, it's also really important to understand, and this uh, from you know, folks on the security side, you have to have some context with the development teams, which uh, you may or may not have yet, but scanning is a means to an end, right? It's not the, you know, the, you know, the scan is not a, uh, an activity that has a point in and of itself. <clears throat> the goal of scanning uh, or of testing is to identify vulnerabilities, uh, but once you identify those vulnerabilities, you've got to actually manage those vulnerabilities, which means you've got to run them through to conclusion. Um, so that's an important thing to understand. We see you know, too many environments that we go into where we'll come in, do testing, blow stuff up, you know, provide a report with recommendations, you know, come back a year later, do the same testing, blow the same thing up, and we're like, uh, you know, you, you know, you've, you've known about this, this is just important stuff, or you've known about it for a year, you know, why, haven't, why haven't you done anything about it? And again, that comes back to having you know, poor vulnerability management practices in place. So that even if you're finding vulnerabilities as a result, you know, if you're kicking up vulnerabilities as a result of doing a bunch of scanning, um, you know, if, if, if nothing ever happens with those vulnerabilities, you haven't really gotten a lot of value out of the assurance activities that you've undertaken. So what goes into a successful scanning program? Uh, you know, the first thing is a solid understanding of your organization's attack surface. Um, and this is something that is, that is very, very, you know, I've, I've found to be very important. I've been in very scary meetings where folks that work in the same organization you know, discover that their application portfolio is growing by leaps and bounds. Right? Where they say, okay, well, we've got this application. Well, what about the version that we set up for this important customer? Oh, no, that application's been taken down. No, it hasn't. I had to respond to an incident on that server you know, a couple weeks ago. Okay, well, now we have twice. Now we have two applications up instead of one. <laughs> and people go around the table, and you find more and more applications that got stood up and things that never got end of life. And so in a lot of organizations, um, you know, Nobody has a really good handle on what the, of, of what the organization's attack surface is from a standpoint of what web, software, and other systems they have. And things like mobile and things like the cloud have only made that worse. Uh, does anybody here feel like they've got a good list of apps in their organization? Anybody? Yeah, that, this guy? Congratulations, excellent. <coughs> Nobody else? <laughs> um, yeah. <coughs> You also need to have a realistic concept of scanner effectiveness. There's certain vulnerabilities that a scanner is going to be able to find uh, in an automated way. There's other classes of vulnerabilities that automation is simply never going to be able to find. Um, and you know, usually I, I see that that breaks down you know, between coding flaws uh, like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, that scanners, both the code scanners, uh, both the static and the dynamic scanners are, are, are you know, pretty good in a lot of cases at catching. Uh, versus more design or architecture oriented flaws um, that deal with the business logic or the specific requirements of a given application in the context that, you know, in which it's uh, deployed. And so it's important to understand, you know, for this scanning that I'm doing or for this testing that I'm doing, what am I really getting out of that? How thorough um, a, a, a insight do I have about the application, uh, about the security state of this particular ap application? 
Um, another thing that we look for is a, a disciplined history of scanning. Again, as applications change over time, you need to go back and retest. Um, and maybe you only need, re need to retest parts of the application. Um, you know, maybe for certain releases, you need to retest the entire thing. But again, these applications typically don't, you know, number one, the attackers don't live in a vacuum or, 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 or you know, don't live in a static environment. Uh, new attack techniques are developed. Um, and, and so that's something to pay attention to. Um, but in addition, you know, and more important in most situations, applications change over time. And it's important to make sure that this is an ongoing activity. It's not a one-time activity, but it's a program of ongoing scanning. Uh, finally, the prioritization of your testing efforts. Um, you know, if, if, everything is, um, if, if everything is important, then nothing is important, right? So if everything is equally, if, if, if everything, uh, you know, if every application is a critical, you know, then you might as well say that every application is a low, right? You have to be able to prioritize. And unless somebody here works in an organization with an infinite budget, uh, you know, infinite resources and infinite budget for software assurance and testing, you're probably going to have to make some trade-offs. Uh, to determine which applications are we going to look at in a cursory fashion, which ones are we going to select for deeper, uh, you know, for, for deeper and more thorough assurance activities. And so, you know, what we see is a progression in a lot of organizations, you know, looking at, uh, you know, as you try to determine what is your software attack surface. You know, so you start out with the software that you currently know about. You know, a lot of times these are critical legacy systems. Um, you know, notable web applications. These are the uh, you know these are the applications where a lot of value flows through it, and so everybody knows about it. You know, uh, your auditors you know, again, if it's subject to PCI or something, your auditors are probably ha hassling you about it. You know, in a lot of cases, we see organizations that have um, you know formal SLAs for application performance and security with you know with uh, important customers. Um, you may know about an application because a bad guy found it before you did and managed to do something wrong, so you had an incident. Um, but again, in most organizations starting out on this journey, there's you know, everybody in their head has a couple ideas of, yeah, these are the applications that we know about um, you know, because these are the ones where a lot of, you know, where a lot of value is flowing through. You know, then organizations start to figure out, like, oh, okay, well, let's figure out the rest of the web-based systems that we have. You know, what are the different lines of business that we have and what applications have they deployed in support of whatever stuff they're doing? Right? Or what are, what are the one-off pieces of software that we've developed to support some specific function that now actually lives there? You know, why'd you miss this originally? You may have forgot it was there. Uh, the line of business might have procured it through some sort of a non-standard channel. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, um, you know, this problem gets infinitely harder if you're, if you're in an organization that uh, you know, does a lot of mergers, right? where all of a sudden you're like, well, we've got our applications plus all the applications that these maniacs you know, down in Atlanta have as well, or you know, whatever the particular situation is. If you uh, you know push even farther than that, you know then you need to start looking at the software you bought from someone, uh, you know, and that speaks to you know, the, the things Joe was uh, talking about uh, in, the, in the last session, talking about the software supply chain. All right, it's not just the software that you're developing; you know it's the you know, components that roll up into that, as well as the software you're buying from other folks. Again, a lot of these done in support of uh, line of business, uh, you know things that support infrastructure, and again, uh, you know. Uh, Why did you miss it? Well, a lot of scanners uh, only really work well on web applications, and so you're probably not going to know, you, you, you may not be thinking about your client server applications or other things like that. Uh, a lot of people assume, well, oh, well, I'm sure the vendor, I'm, I'm sure the software vendor has gone and done uh, you know, whatever, uh, whatever due diligence they need to before they sold me the software. Now, and finally, you know, uh, the kind of the last set of things we see are uh, you know, mobile apps, right? You know, the, the cloud. <laughs> now I love the cloud because now everybody with like a five hundred dollar limit purchase card is now their own uh, you know, is now their own purchasing officer, right? Everybody with everybody with a credit card in your organization is now their own purchasing department. Yay! <laughs> uh, you know, shadow IT. <laughs> you know, same thing with mobile applications. You know, we see in a lot of cases these get procured through non traditional channels, um, mostly because the you know, uh, you know some some group of line of business says, you know, it would be really great for innovation if we had a mobile app that would do X, Y, Z. We could really serve our customers well. We could build a lot of value if we if we had a mobile app that did this. And they go to their IT department, and the IT department says, sure, we'll get our developers on it. They can start gathering requirements in two years, and you can expect your software two years after that. All right? Or they go to the security department, and the security person says, whatever you're asking, the answer is no, but you still need to fill out these three forms for me. All right? <laughs> and so naturally, all right. <laughs> um, you know, a, a, a spunky employee um, you know, who likes to be rewarded for accomplishing their goals uh, you know, then goes to find some offshore developers that are more than happy to put together some software. They'll even put it in the app store for you. 
You know, and so you know, what we see are with the cloud, again, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and with you know, kind of newer technologies like mobile, we see that they don't get procured through the normal channels. And so it's easy to add to your organization's attack surface and not even know about it. Uh, and it's interesting, it's been interesting to me to see uh, you know, different ways, both technical and uh, you know, non-technical, that, uh, you know, that you can use to find these, uh, uh, to find these things. There's a, uh, there's a startup. They're called Cloudability. Um, and their, their whole deal um, is that they help organizations um, optimize their cloud spend by, by going in and working with their accounting department to figure out, like, oh, by the way, do you know that you guys have 72 Amazon uh, AWS accounts? Uh, right? Maybe if you like, pool those together, uh, you'd find that you could get a little bit better volume pricing. <laughs> um, or do you know that you have like, 17 different instances, uh, you know, instances where you've purchased you know, Salesforce or whatever else? Um, and so, uh, you know, similarly, you know, non-technical means going through and talking to disaster recovery folks. Right? Hey, what, what do we have disaster recovery plans for? Right? If something's important enough to have a disaster recovery plan, it's probably important enough to think about the security of it. And so, uh, you know, that in addition to you know, using network scanning and things like that to identify a web application on different segments of the network. And so, the, you know, the attack surface is the, really like the security officer's journey is, uh, you know, What's your insight in the attack surface? What's the uh, or what's the, what's your perception of the attack surface? What assets do you understand uh, are, you know, make part of that attack surface? And what level of insight do you have into you know those types of applications that your organization has developed? So you think, oh, okay, well, web applications. That's something we need to worry about. You know, client server applications. Yeah, that's probably something we need to be concerned about as well. Uh, desktop applications. Those may you know those probably have uh, you know, you know or potentially have security implications as well. You know, cloud applications, mobile applications, and so on and so forth. You know, also, you see that, uh, you know, hey, we have some discovery activities. We find a couple. Uh, you know, we go and ask a couple people. We find some more. And uh, you know, over time, what you see is a progression. <clears throat> and uh, once, once you understand all the different things that expose you to uh, software risk and you have perfect insight in them, I believe they call that enlightenment. And I, I don't believe anyone has ever reached that stage. Um, Another important thing, and when we talk about the depth of scanning, you know, if, if you, you know, if you, and we've seen this, uh, a lot of challenges in this with procurement language, right? Uh, when people are going out and looking for testing services, you know, what are you actually getting when you have, you know, when, when you get an application test, right? Because there's a lot of things that could potentially go into that, and it's important to understand, you know, when you want to talk about the thoroughness of the testing that you're doing, you need to understand which components um, you know, of, of, of the available testing types that are out there that you've undertaken. Right? You know, and again, this, uh, you know, for, for most organizations, you're looking at dynamic analysis versus static analysis. Am I testing a running application, or am I looking at an application that is uh, um, you know, the artifacts, the source code of the binaries? You know, we look at automated application scanning. Again, great at finding certain technical flaws in applications. Not great uh, or, 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 or completely incapable in a lot of cases of finding uh, you know, business logic type flaws, logic flaws in applications, right? And that can be applied both to uh, dynamic analysis as well as static analysis, right? Source code scanners great at finding certain things with control flow analysis, data flow analysis, you know, but they don't understand uh, you know, that your application is dealing with credit card data. They don't understand the, the environment your application is deployed out into. And so there's a lot of things, there's a lot of flaws that you can only find in cases where you are doing um, you know, manual code review as well. You know, are your scans uh, you know, unauthenticated or are they authenticated? Um, you know, a huge problem that we've seen before uh, in the past uh, with folks is they'll turn on the web scanner, point it at the application, it scans the home page and the login page, no vulnerabilities, declare victory. Yay, my application is totally secure. Granted, there's 500 pages behind the login that the, uh, you know, that the application never saw, yeah. but the scanner said it was clean, so I guess, uh, I guess we're secure. <laughs> you know, same thing, you know, looking at uh, you know, penetration testing. You know, is this blind penetration testing, or is this uh, you know, something where, you, you know, where, where the folks are starting out with some, uh, you know, some information? You know, and finally, looking at the static analysis, you know, you've got automated review. Are you looking at the source code? Are you looking at the binary? Um, you know, so on and so forth. And so you know, it's important when you look at the testing that you're performing to understand you know, these are the components, these are the activities that went into this test. And as a result, I should expect that we have, we, you know, have identified or we would have found um, you know, uh, whatever vulnerabilities uh, you know, 
I should expect to find with that type of test. Uh, again, if everything is critically important, then nothing's important. Um, some applications matter more than others. Um, you know, and uh, you know, each organization is going to have a different way of determining this. Uh, a big driver that we see in a lot of cases is the value or the character of the data being managed by an application. You know, that's what you see when uh, with things like PCI. Um, you know, hey, does this application touch cardholder data? It does. Cool. Well, now it's in scope for PCI. You know, you also look at the value of the transactions being processed uh, and the cost of downtime. If the, you know, if this application goes down, is that uh, you know, is that something? You know, the company picnic application. Maybe people are sad and nobody can sign up for the picnic, or too many people bring uh, you know coleslaw or something. Uh, but at the end of the day, not a bad thing. <clears throat> you know, contrast that with the, your you know, online banking or transaction processing system, um, where downtime is, is you know, a lot more important. And you know, because of this, you can't treat all applications the same. Uh, you've got to put different levels of resources toward assurance activities based on the value of the application. Uh, and you're, you'll select different activities. And, uh, you know, and again, unfortunately or, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, unfortunately in a lot of cases, all this has to be done um, you know, within the constraints you have as a result of the, um, uh, of the regulatory uh, you know, system that you and your organization operate under. <coughs> And so you want to uh, allocate different, uh, again, uh, allocate different levels of activities to, uh, you know, to these different applications. Um, we've put together a system uh, and released it open source, um, and I'll run through a quick example of this, um, that, that helps to address some of these things. Um, and it's called ThreadFix. It's avail available off of Google code under uh, Mozilla Public License. And it lets you do a number of different things. Uh, it lets you build up your application portfolio and, uh, you know, and, and characterize the applications in the portfolio. How important are they? It lets you store the results of different assurance activities. You can load in scans from a lot of the popular free and uh, open source and commercial, both dynamic and static scanning tools, as well as things that you find from, a, uh, you know, from manual penetration testing, threat modeling, and things like that. So you can start to store all the results of your assurance activities in one centralized, uh, in one centralized place. Uh, and that's good because what that starts to let you do as you track scanning over time, so if I'm loading scans in over time, each time it gets a new scan, it diffs it against the previous one to find out, have new vulnerabilities shown up, have old vulnerabilities gone away, have you know, previously fixed vulnerabilities resurfaced. And what you find is as you start to do this stuff over time, you can, you, know, you, you can start to actually start to track some metrics on your program. And so you no longer have a collection of unrelated assurance activities Right, I've got a uh, you know I've, I've got a, a drawer full of you know 300 page PDF printouts uh, from all these scans. You know, instead you're treating this stuff as data, and you can start to have a much more quantitative description or a quantitative discussion with the you know, powers that be in your organization. All right, I'll go through a quick demo. Uh, yesterday I was given demos at another organization, and my laptop had a hard crash right before my demo started. Today my system is running really slow, so I'm sure this will turn out well. Um, so when you log into ThreadFix, you first see uh, you know, just a kind of a basic dashboard that shows you, you know, some trending over time, uh, you know, of you know, vulnerabilities that they show up and they go away. What's the level of criticality? And you also see, you know, what are the applications that we have? Uh, you know, what are our top ten uh, or you know, top ten most vulnerable applications? Here we don't have a full ten apps loaded in. Uh, you can also see you know, recent scans that have been uploaded, and you can see the Jim Manico types and things into my computer earlier. Um, and so you know, there's some collaboration capabilities in there. Oops. Give this a second, because my laptop hates me today. But uh, then you can drill into the applications. And as I said, you can start to upload the results of your scanning. So if you're running uh, AppScan or something like that, uh, and you're running it over time, you can load all this data into one central location and start to track what vulnerabilities you're identifying in, the, in these applications. Now, and again, as you start to do this, you can track it over time, so you can start to see trending data. So the advantage of storing all this stuff in one place is, is again, that you can start to report on this data. and what we've seen is it facilitates a much better conversation with management. If you go to management and tell them, you know, so software security is the thing I'm concerned about this week, and cross-site scripting is scary, right? 
if you go to an energy company, right, and you go to their CFO, uh, or, 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 or an airline company, you go to their CFO and you say, you know, cross-site scripting is scary. What they're gonna tell you is, hey, every time the price of a barrel of oil shifts by a dollar, I lose 20 million bucks a day. That's scary. Cross-site scripting is not scary. All right, if you go to an energy company CEO or, or your risk manager and say, hey, cross-site scripting is scary, they're gonna come back and they're gonna say, well, you know what, we had eight guys kidnapped in Congo last week and one of our guys got like eaten in Papua New Guinea last year. Like, that's scary. You know, like, you, you wanna talk about managing risk, those are the risks that are really impactful in my business. That's the stuff that, that, that we're scared about. You know, but, okay, now everything's working great. <coughs> Um, so, but a, a cool thing that you get when you start to track these scanning activities over time is that you can, you can see, hey, what's the prevalence of certain vulnerabilities, right? What percentage of those vulnerabilities have I fixed? Uh, is everybody here familiar with the reports, uh, either or both from uh, White Hat Security and Veracode? Everybody seen those in the past? Excellent, yeah. Great stuff, right? Where you know, they've, they've looked over all the scanning that they've done and they can talk about, hey, for this industry, companies of this size, you know, we have, uh, you know, they see this much SQL injection, this much cross-site scripting. They've fixed this percentage of the critical or high vulnerabilities that they've identified. Like really, really cool data, because what that lets you do as an organization is you can start to benchmark against that. Right? If you've got a report like this that shows what are the different types of vulnerability, how many have we found, what are the percent that we've fixed, you know, what's the average age of the remaining, and what's the average time it takes me to close, all of a sudden that puts you in a situation where you can start having a grown up conversation with management where you can say, here's third party data about the state of the software security industry, right? <clears throat> you know, as, as you can see, peer organizations to us, you know, fix vulnerabilities on average in 50 days. We're not fixing, or we're fixing vulnerabilities on average in 75 days. You know, this is something we need to devote more effort to, right? We are falling out of step with our peers. Um, we need to, vote, uh, to devote more effort to this. You know, or you could say, hey, in industry, it takes people 50 days to fix this. You know, I'm, my team is fixing them in 25 days. Clearly, I deserve a bonus for my effective use of scarce resources. Yeah. <laughs> the, I mean, however you want the statistics to lie, um, you're, you're more than welcome to use them. You know, but the important thing is now you start to have actual statistics. You can start talking in a quantitative way um, about how your program is working. And that's a much more powerful discussion to have when you're trying to justify budget, when you're trying to justify headcount, you know, when you're trying to demonstrate, hey, you, know, you spent $100,000 buying technology XYZ. You know, as you can see, you know, we've discovered this many apps in our portfolio, we've you know, identified these vulnerabilities, and now, we've got the, you know, and, and now we've managed to actually fix a lot of this stuff as well. Uh, and so that's a great way, you know, again, in a, to, to speak in a quantitative manner about what you're doing in your organization you know, how successful you've been, and to use that data to then go and justify further activity. Uh, and again, that's, uh, you know, you can download that from Google Code. The 1.2 uh, final release just came out uh, last week, two weeks ago. Um, so, in, in closing, kind of steps for improvement. Really important to build your application portfolio. You know, too many organizations have no clue what their application attack surface looks like, and you cannot reasonably expect that you're going to be able to defend application attack surface that you don't even know about. You know, you're really, you're, 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 any sort of assurance program to be considered an actual program, you've gotta know, you've gotta have at least an idea of what your attack surface looks like. <clears throat> I think it's important to characterize the effectiveness of the efforts that you've made to date. What assurance activities have you undertaken what was the value that you got out of those? You know, then you need to build a plan for coverage. Well, now that you know your attack surface, you've got to have a plan to figure out, you know, if I have this level of resources, you know, what can I reasonably expect to cover? And you know, for this coverage, what depth of insight should I expect to, uh, to get out of that? And you've got to monitor progress over time. You know, these aren't the types of things, you know, especially in a space like software security where you have to have the intersection of development teams, security teams, IT audit teams, you know, uh, all of those folks have to come together and talk about trade-offs between, you know, cool, fancy new features and functionality versus fixing old problems and addressing technical debt. You know, this is something that doesn't happen overnight. It's something that has to happen over time, again, which is why I think it's really valuable to have the, uh, you know, to have this trending and historical data that you can look back to.
Uh, the bug tracking capabilities, yeah. And so uh, one of the things that you can do uh, that, I, that I forgot to mention, uh, so the question is, hey, we have a, what are the bug tracking capabilities? Um, we give, uh, like in, in ThreadFix, what you can do is you can go in and slice and dice your vulnerability data and ship it over to defect tracking systems. And so if you've got a scan with 100 uh, cross-site scripting uh, results, right, you probably want to get those in the hands of developers, right? So that they'll actually fix them. You probably don't want to take 100 cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and turn them into 100 bugs because then the QA manager will murder you in the parking lot, right? Because the, you know, that's just not how, you know, the, 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 it's gonna take more time to administer the bugs than it will to fix them. Um, and so uh, what you can do is you can go in and say, well, let's break this up into blocks of 15, uh, or let's take all the bugs in a certain part, of, or all the vulnerabilities in a certain part of an application and make that a bug. And so uh, you can bundle the vulnerabilities up, ship them over to defect tracking systems, and then, um, you know, ThreadFix pulls the defect tracking systems on an ongoing basis to identify when the developers say the bug status has changed. And so you can see when the developers think that they fixed the problem to, re to schedule a new scan. Um, and uh, right now we have out of the box integrations with um, Bugzilla, Jira, and uh, Microsoft Team Foundation server. Um, there's a cloud-based uh, there's a cloud-based bug tracker called Version One that we also have tentative support for, and there's a plugin uh, API. So that uh, if you if you have um, another bug tracker that you want to use, um, you basically just implement a Java class. There's like you know, six or seven methods that you need to implement. To, you know, give me a session, make a bug, check a status, um, and, and things like that. And so uh, the the you know out of the box, we've got you know, you know kind of three or four popular systems supported. Um, and then what we see is there's kind of a really long tail with defect tracking systems that uh, the different folks use. And so we've tried to make it as easy as possible. Um, you know, we've got example code on the on the project wiki and things like that. Uh, great, great question. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? All right, well, thank you all very much.